that can only mean one thing. When you hear that thumping stand-up bass, it can only mean one thing. It's time for the Steam Room, the world's third most popular podcast. How do I know that? I have no idea. It might be even higher than that. Chuck, don't you think it might be even higher Ernie, than that? Ernie, the best part about telling a lie is you got to run with it. They wouldn't have known we were lying if you ran with it. It is, if you do say it with enough conviction, people yes. will believe it. So well, I was wrong. It's the second most popular. <laughs> I'm that? sorry. Man, my mistake. Uh, welcome, everybody. Ernie Johnson and Charles Barkley. How are you doing this week, man? How are you? Well, Ernie, uh, I'm doing really good. Uh, I'm really concerned about these sports, man. Uh, I'm worried about my players uh, because, man, this is, uh, this is the scariest thing I've been through in my life. All sports in general, you're worried about NBA players? Who are you worried about? I'm worried about? about all the sports. I've been hanging out with my hockey friends out here in Arizona. I'm wor I'm starting to read stuff about the NBA, and then you got baseball. And I think the number one thing, <laughs> I got to give my man Tim Kirchner some credit. First of all, he does a fantastic job, but he had the best line I've heard in a long time. He says, one thing about these sports we just going to have to take the best bad idea and go forward. He said, he says, you know, everybody's looking for a great idea. He said, there's no great ideas. We just going to have to take the best bad decision and go forward. And I thought no truer words had ever been said. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I see what he's saying. It's like, there is no really great plan out there. There's just like, okay. I mean, cause ideally you play a season, the way you're supposed to play a season. Anything else is going to come up short. And now, so which comes up the least short of these? Which of these is doable? And and shoot, Chuck, who knows if anything's doable? I I still I don't know. I don't know. I don't feel any better right now than I did when this thing started. You know, several weeks ago. It's, I'm I'm still like I'm confused. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, let me ask you a question because you're in the hotbed. Where are you at on the governor of your state relaxing restrictions, opening up tattoo parlors, mani pedis, and gyms? Probably the three worst places you can get the coronavirus, uh, <laughs> in my opinion. Well, Cheryl and I were having a long talk about that the other day as we sat through a double feature, then went to a bowl a few frames, and then, and then get matching tats. <laughs> no, no, it was, uh, no, it surprised me just like it surprised you and a lot of people. And look, I realize, you know, I, I think I realize where that's coming from. This has been so hard on so many people. We've been inconvenienced through this. That's, yes. you know, I've got a job. I can feed my family. Uh, everybody's feeling good. You know, so it's a, a different kind of a rhythm to the day, but a lot of other people have really been hit hard. So I, I can see what he's trying to do and try to, and trying to jumpstart things. But man, when you start, when you start taking steps like that, before you've met the, the federal guidelines for like plateauing or, you know, for 14 days, having the number of cases drop, um, then you're taking a chance. And I, I applaud those businesses down here who have said, okay, I understand that I could open my doors, but I'm not going to do it for a couple more weeks. You know, and you see it all around the country, Chuck. It's, it's a touchy thing because you do want the economy to improve, but the health and safety of people has to be, has to be at the forefront. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, like I say, I mean, clearly, you know, I feel so bad for all these people who don't have a job and who probably not going to get their job back because a lot of these restaurants are not going to reopen. But like I say, then they're going to get hit that people not going to have money to go out and go to those restaurants. And, you know, it's just really, it, it's just really sad. Uh, I saw Dr. Fauci says, hey, guys, we might have to accept the fact that we're not going to play sports. And because I would hate, I would hate to start basketball over and somebody get sick. That's the concern too with, with everybody trying to get back to some 
normalcy, trying to open up on a limited basis. Um, but when you hear about, uh, okay, what about a second wave, you know, and then if you have to close then, or if you, if you, if the infection and the spread of the coronavirus gets up to that level again, I mean, that's the scary part of it. And that's the, and that's the unknown, man. That's the, that's the part that, that always gets you. And I, and, and I can, what I can liken it to just on the unknown part about it, Chuck. Look, I've been through cancer before and the worst part of it, one of the worst parts of it for me was the unknown. Once you, like you were diagnosed, but you didn't know how you were yeah. going to go after it, that unknown or waiting for that phone call to tell you, Oh, okay, it's this. Once you know, you put your head down and fight. Yeah. But, but we don't, we haven't gotten to that point where we can say now that we know because we don't. Uh, it's so many people lives are affected. And I tell people, and I've been straightforward. I said, man, I'm not worried about basketball. I'm not worried about football. I'm not worried about baseball. I said, man, it's, it's, this thing is going to be catastrophic from a financial standpoint for so many people. Like, I've been trying to eat out a couple days a week. Uh, and I'm like, they're like, we want to thank you for coming in, but this ain't sustainable for us much longer. And I'm like, I say, hey, I'm going to keep coming. As long as y'all open, I'm going to keep coming. And you just feel so bad. Because I, I, I'm a, such a creature of habit. I only go to like three restaurants. Yeah. And you get to know the people who work there and the owners really, really well. And you just see their pain. And, and they're telling me like, they don't want to fire people or lay people off. But it doesn't make economic sense to have employees and they're like, hey, it is what it is. We just hope we come out of the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and you know what? There, there, are, there are poignant moments uh, in the kind of transactions you talk about and going to a restaurant or you know, trying to help them as much as you can. Because last night, there's a place out here uh, near Brazelton called Local Station that, that is providing um, you know, a pickup and that kind of thing. You can go to the curbside and they'll, and they have these family dinners that, that we found have to be the perfect size for our family as where we are. And so, you know, you go and you have your mask on and your gloves on and you're, and you're taking this food from the person who works there, who's got the mask on. Yeah. And there's a, there's that moment when you can't see a smile and you can't, but you lock eyes. Yeah. And it's, like, and it's like, we're, man, we're trying to help you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for providing yeah. us with, with such great meals. And, and I think we'll look back on those moments too, as this goes on and say that, you know, that it, it, there's something to being brought together uh, just by staring somebody in the eye and saying, thanks, you know, so. Every single day, several times a day, I see something on the news that almost brings me to tears where people are just being grateful and thankful and trying to be a good person to their neighbors and to the frontline workers, the nurses and the doctors. But you see something every single day that makes you be like, yeah, man, we don't see enough of this. Uh, and that's, and, and so that, that, that to me has been probably out of an awful situation, the best thing in this thing do we see the goodness of people that is an excellent point and i think you you during normal times you appreciate those really well done features the ones that kind of tug at your heartstrings but at a time like this when it's when the first 20 minutes of the network news is all like oh my goodness and then all of a sudden it's look what these people thought you know i wonder yeah, and it makes you say why couldn't i think of something like that that's really, that's really good. That was really a great idea. And, um, and so, yeah, we, uh, you know, I think we can, if we all just try to think about what might make one person's day better and, 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 to, and to constantly show our appreciation to the people who are on that yeah. front line. And I'm not just talking about the medical folks. I'm talking about the, the Amazon driver who shows up in my driveway and yeah. the UPS guy 
and the and, and they've been doing it all day long and and uh, and those who work at the restaurants and everybody else so when those yeah. folks who are getting up and going to work on a limited you know not the way it always is kind of basis but still showing up that's uh they deserve every they deserve every amount of thanks and praise we can give them yes sir and that's you know we didn't label that first of all but i but i think that qualifies i i was just getting ready to say we didn't do a first of all but that's a perfect first of all my kids were really jealous last week when they listened to the podcast and said man you guys were talking to guy fietti and i was like yeah we were man the guy was awesome uh it was such a good segment i got to i got to say we've had going back to sanjay jake tapper uh chris I mean, fowler we, chris fowler i mean we've had some amazing guests so kudos to who actually does the hard work of getting a guest every week you know who our guest is today chuckster yeah i i, I listen we've we've met before uh, yeah. me, me, me and JJ met at the final four for the first time. And oh, then, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And then, so when he got hurt, I sent him a text. I got his number and I sent him a text and his mom sent me back the sweetest text. Uh, said, well, JJ's obviously in surgery, but thanks. And, and JJ called me, texted me back when he got out of surgery. It was pretty cool. You're always good about doing that, Chuckster. I've got so yeah. many... I have so many stories about people who said, like, man, right out of the blue, I got a text or I got a phone call from Charles Barkley. And, and man, you're, you've always been very, very good about doing that and making that call at just the right time. I've had some guys call me at my darkest moment, and I'll try to share that going forward. Well done there, there, big fella. And we're going we're gonna to take a short break here on the, on the steam room. And when we continue, the guy that Charles was just talking about, J.J. Watt. On the newlywed J.J. Watt, as a matter of fact. Uh, got married in February, Chuckster, you know that? Yeah, I know. Man, alive. She's a I great guess. soccer player, too. Yes, yeah, she is. We'll talk yes. about her. We'll talk about J.J.'s life. Talk about playing the NFL with a couple of brothers. Man, he's got a great story, and we'll dive into it next on The Steam Room. Keep your towels on. We welcome you back. To the steam room episode 15 of the steam room and to all you loyal steamers out there thank you very much for your support uh it is our pleasure uh, the pleasure of me ernie johnson and uh charles barkley to special welcome guest. Yes, special guest yes special guest that's a special guest alert goes out for jj watt um jj thank you so much uh, obviously the all pro from the houston texans and um the guy who's got two brothers playing in the NFL. Uh, I mean, this is this is an amazing story. And before we get into all of that stuff, JJ, how are you feeling? How is the family feeling um, as you as you shelter in place there in uh, Pewaukee, Wisconsin? I'm doing well. You know, I can't complain too much. I'm in a very fortunate situation. I'm up here in Wisconsin and uh, I have a gym on the property. I have some land I can run around on and do my workouts. So uh, I can't complain too much. I have the dogs up here. They, they're they running around. They've never seen this much land and their, their ability to run. I don't know how I'm ever going to reel them back in again to live in Houston again. But uh, family's good. Everybody's good. We're, we're fortunate in this situation. You know, JJ, this is... Obviously, I'm a lot older than you, but still the craziest thing I've ever been through in my life. How have you adjusted to just sheltering in place? I mean, I mean, obviously you got a magnificent place, but it's still weird. I got a good place also, but it's still weird not being able to do anything but really kind of work out and just stay home. Yeah, I mean, it's it's truly unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it, and I think. Like I said, I'm fortunate to have the workouts because if I wasn't able to get the energy out and just kind of stuck in the house, I don't know what I would do. But my uh, my wife and I, we just got married in February. And so uh, the first couple months of marriage, the honeymoon stage goes extremely quickly when <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're in a situation like this right out of the gate. You know? Hey, hey, it always goes extremely quickly. I'll tell you that. Uh, but so what's that so what's that been like for you and Kalia to be uh 
to be in this close of proximity uh, because you have to be, and there's no, you know, with yeah. all the uncertainty on football. No, it's been great. You know, it's, I think it's one of those things that you really find out a lot about uh, the situation you have. And, and I, we're very lucky, you know, we've, we've had our moments for sure. I mean, uh, dishes and laundry, who gets to do this, who's doing that? Why didn't you do this? But overall, I'm very, uh, pleased and it's been incredible and it's been a lot of fun because you we don't get that much time to get to know each other throughout this her her season is during my off season my season is during her off season so it never really mixes in this year with her being in Chicago and playing for Chicago it was going to be extremely difficult um, so we just take full advantage of the opportunity we get right now to see family to to hang out and to enjoy ourselves and our, like I said our dogs are loving it I don't know what they're going to do so who does the cleaning and I'm um, like, who does the dishes? Who does the laundry? What else are you divvying up? I'm dishes. I'm dishes. Uh, I'm in charge of the dishes, dishwasher, hand washing dishes, cheese laundry. Um, and we both have attempted cooking quite a bit and we have set off the fire alarm in our house four times in the whole thing, <laughs> which I think percentage wise is I'll take it four times in whatever, two months, I'll take it. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> my specialty is still pouring cereal into a bowl with milk. Hey, you know, let me ask you this question about football. This virtual stuff they're talking about now, how weird is it going to be for you not to go to OTAs not being around your teammates, trying to learn everything just, I guess, via a computer. So my rookie year was the year of the lockout, uh, the 2011 lockout, where there were no off-season programs, no rookie mini camps, no OTAs. So I actually have a bit of familiarity with not having any off-season going straight to training camp. That part of it actually, from learning the playbook and stuff like that, isn't the biggest deal, especially for veterans, because you pick up the playbook quick, you've been around for long enough. For rookies, it's definitely tougher, but the chemistry aspect is is the difficult part, like you're talking about. It's it's chemistry, it's being around the guys, it's building those relationships, and that's what you really miss during this time of the year. Um, and this week is our first week of virtual meetings, so it's been, you can imagine, Chuck, I would, I would love to have seen you in virtual meetings back in the day, if you would have attended. I don't know if you would have <laughs> up. <laughs> But I mean, I would have loved to see, we're watching the last dance now. And I'm like, you're telling me that Dennis Rodman is going to sit in front of a camera in his house to listen to Phil Jackson teach the plays. It's like, I don't know if he's doing that every day, but we've had guys doing it every day. And it's actually been really good. You know, we had some technical glitches here and there, but it, attendance has been good. Guys have been locked in and it's been kind of fun to hear the voices, see the faces and be around the team again. Cause you can kind of virtually build that camaraderie. So let me ask you this question since you're watching the last dance. I I could I'm gonna tell you my reaction. When 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 Dennis says he needs a vacation in the middle of the season, I thought I almost fell out of my chair laughing so hard. What was your first inclination when you saw that? My first inclination was I looked at my wife and I kind of recapped the situation. I was like, wait, they're in the middle of the season going for a six peat, like the sixth <laughs> championship. He's got yellow hair. He's six foot seven. And he's going to go to Las Vegas with Carmen Electra. And nobody's going to say anything. Like, <laughs> I, I, just, I was like, in today's world, can you imagine the tweets, the snaps? Like, it would just, it would blow people's minds. Um, but then, I mean, 10 seconds later, I think I saw him drinking a Miller Lite and then hopping on a Harley Davidson. So, I mean, all the rules are out the window. I thought, you know what? I thought I was the only person who noticed that. I was like, did this dude just drink a beer and get on a motorcycle? <laughs> did, I, I said, I, I, nobody said anything about that because they were talking about the vacation. I was like, the dude just, he's got a beer and he jumps on a motorcycle. I was on the floor during that episode, I'm not going to lie. One episode is not enough for Dennis. Dennis needs, his, he needs 10. He needs his own series. Hey, uh, you can learn a lot about, about a person when you go back through their social media uh, history, recent social media history. Uh, you know what I love is how you are volunteering. And I don't know, look, have you ever, had you heard of Zoom before this all happened? Uh, very little. I didn't know a lot about it. But, but you're kind of offering your services and saying, look, you want me to drop in on your Zoom meeting? I'll do it. How many takers have you had? And, and what's, it, what's the reaction been like? Oh, it's wild. So I did, I said, I want to drop in on some Zoom meetings. And 
I wanted people to tell me when they were having it so I could drop in and then I could direct message them and say, okay, what's the meeting room number? Instead, people just started throwing out their meeting room numbers, <laughs> passwords. I'm like, no, no, don't do this. So uh, I, anyways, I got, I got about 20 yesterday that I actually hopped into. And I mean, the wide range of things. I, I had one that was a college D3 football team. I was watching film with them. That was cool. Uh, I had one that was a, a fifth grade special needs class, and we sang happy birthday to a kid. It was incredible. Oh, that's awesome. And then I hopped into one that was like these five teachers having a happy hour drinking beer. <laughs> I mean, just a wide range of things. And it was actually a lot of fun because you get to personally interact with the people as opposed to like a Twitter or an Instagram where it's just the masses. This was me with five people with 10 people, and you can have real conversation. You know, I've known about you for a long time. Obviously, you've been around. I did not know that you went to college to actually play tight end. Yeah. What What was that first conversation? Because obviously, if a coach say, hey, JJ, you're not good enough to play tight end. We're going to move you to a position. What was that first conversation like? So I coming out of high school, I had probably four or five offers as a DN, but most of my offers were as a tight end. Uh, so I went to Central Michigan and started at tight end there. The conversation that was tough was when they said they wanted to move me to offensive tackle. And I said, no, 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 no. This, <laughs> I don't know. That's great. It's awesome. But I don't want to do that. Uh, so that's when I actually ended up transferring and moving to Wisconsin and switching over to defensive side of the ball. But, yeah, when they because because I started at Central Michigan. Central Michigan had Joe Staley, who just retired the last, this last week. He was an unbelievable player. He started as a tight end. He moved offensive tackle and had an unbelievable career. I mean, the guy's incredible. And so they kind of had that vision in their head for me. They wanted to do that with me. Uh, and do I think it would have worked if I did it? Maybe. Yeah, I think it, it definitely could have. Um, but I was, I just had that mindset that I wanted to choose my destiny on every play. And I think defense does that. You get a chance, you get to kind of have a little freedom. And I like that. Those are, those are the dogs you're talking about. They sound yeah. very happy. And if yeah. I were delivering something to, to the house right now, I would probably uh, just drop it and leave. Uh, <laughs> so I got a question for you. Uh, Derek and TJ going to be yeah. going to be uh, teammates with the Steelers now. Right. Of the three of you, who's the best natural athlete? Man, I mean, I I will never say it's not me, but. Uh... <laughs> I can give you breakdowns. <laughs> I can give you breakdowns. So high school, Derek, hands down the best athlete. I mean, not run away with it. He was the punter. He was the kicker. He was the punt returner, kick returner. He set every record at our school. I mean, he was unbelievable. TJ, as far as um, quick twitch, as far as explosion, uh, jumping, things like that, he's, he's really good at that. And then you put it all together. Oh my gosh! Sorry. No, don't worry about it. We're good. Um, you put it all together. <laughs> put Derek and TJ combined, and all the good stuff. And then you got me as an athlete. So it's you know, um, I got you. great, great uh, answer. Yeah, but it's a lot of. That's the most fun about us is when we get to train together. Is that it's true, legitimate competition. It's not like those situations where, you know, you have to let somebody win or you have to like ease up. Us three brothers legitimately can compete at the highest level in almost any activity. You know, your your Texans have had a interesting offseason, uh, to say the least. I want to thank you for DeAndre Hopkins out here in Arizona. Uh, I can't wait to watch him play with the great Larry Fitzgerald and Kyle Murray. What was your first inclination when you heard about the DeAndre Hopkins trade? Uh, I mean, it's, you know, he's – the guy's got the best hands in the league. I mean, he's an incredible player. He's an incredible receiver. And so anytime you lose somebody like that from your team, it's always difficult. Um, but you also at the same time have to put your trust in the people that need to do their jobs, whether it's, you know, GM and on the way up. And so it's well above my pay grade. I can say that. So I'm, I'm never going to say that I'm smart enough to make those decisions that I should be somebody commenting on those choices because that's not my job. And so, my job is to answer for what I have to do. And that's go out on the field and make plays and do what I need to do as a player. So 
Um, anytime you lose a guy like Hop, it's it's always going to be tough because he's such a great player. Uh, and that's just the situation is. But we're excited about the guys that we have coming in, and we look forward to them helping us win. There were a couple of things, uh, JJ. Uh, I saw something the other day that reminded me of Charles that you put out there uh, because you had you had constructed a couple of Chicago hot dogs that were absolute works of art. But then all I could think about was All-Star Weekend. We were in Chicago and somebody brought Charles a Chicago hot dog and he was like, get that thing out of here. We've had this conversation. The only thing you put on hot dogs is chili and onions. Okay, well, there are onions on it. You, don't you want to open your horizons a little bit to see this is what, take a bite of a Chicago dog. I'm not, dog, I'm not no, I'm not, take, I'm not, no, 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 Come on, try a bite of a Chicago dog. What kind of idiot puts a pickle on a hot dog? So there is a, uh, some type of disagreement between the two of you on the value of the Chicago hot dog, correct? So I grew up eating Chicago hot dogs because we're not far from Chicago. So I, I know what it is, but I started out in stages. I started out only liking relish on my hot dog. And then I built up from there. And only recently did I start enjoying every topping on a Chicago style. I can see, and I do fully understand that people that haven't had it throughout their lives, if you looked at that, you'd say, that is not, that does not look good. Um, but I do like that. Did Chuck end up trying it? No, no, <laughs> I did not. I only put I only put chili and onions on my hot dog, JJ. That's the only thing you need to put on hot dogs. Chili and onions, you're golden. All right. Uh, so, okay, I could see that. Did you try deep dish pizza? Uh, I think it's one of the most overrated foods. Oh, in the you're world. wrong. You're wrong, uh, man. You are so wrong on that. And this, this thing about Chicago and New York style pizza, I think they're both very overrated. Uh, oh, the, what, so, what's your style pizza? Well, I, I don't have a style of pizza. I want thin crust. I want pepperoni, sausage, and green olives. That's all I want. Pepperoni, sausage, and green olives. And it has to be thin crust. And it has to be extra, extra, extra large. Uh, now, <laughs> here's the other thing is you guys have both done something. Uh, you can both talk about hosting Saturday Night Live. And, yes. and I'm just wondering where on the nervousness scale, this is for both of you guys, doing the opening monologue of Saturday Night Live has got to be, has got to be way up there on the, uh, man, this is a little nerve wracking side. I watch Chuck's Saturday Night Live monologues to get ideas for mine and to just to see how he did and how it went and everything. And, he did a great job. He did a great job on SNL. Thank People you. love Chuck's SNL appearances. And I see why. It was a lot of fun for me to watch. On the nervousness scale, um, when you're standing behind the door and they're counting you down, <laughs> my, my palms were more sweaty then than before any football game I played. I will say that. Hey, and let me tell you something. On a scale from 1 to 10, it's a 22. <laughs> <laughs> it's, Ernie, it is so nerve-wracking. Uh, you like it, it, you're really just reading, but it's still just nerve wracking. But JJ can tell you this: the entire week, where you're rehearsing like eight to ten hours a day, uh, going throughout the week, that's nerve wracking. There's constantly changing the scripts, but the thing that's probably the hardest thing when you have like two minutes to change clothing for your next skit, like Ernie, they they Velcro. They Velcro all your clothing, and they got three women. You're standing there in your damn underwear, <laughs> and they got three women. They JJ snatch, remembers this. <laughs> oh, they, you, it's, it's three strange women. You're standing there naked with just your underwear on. Uh, they snatch whatever suits you had or whatever outfit you had on, because they Velcroed it, and they got like, they'll count like a minute 20, a minute 45 seconds, and then like you, you, you never have any extra time. When they says 10 seconds, they Velcro the next outfit on and shove you on stage. That is probably the most stressful part of SNL. It is so funny to, it's cool to listen to somebody else who's done it, describe it, because that is exactly what it's like. And I think that they 
a documentary should be made just purely behind the scenes at SNL for a host during the week because a the 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 days are like 10 12 14 hours long the whole week leading up to it and then those women he is not joking the woman will grab your arm yank you and your your shoulder almost comes out of your socket she's <laughs> sprinting across and then, and they just strip you head to toe just 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 stuff is coming off your head and you're like you're just spinning left and right and then all of a sudden they throw you on the stage and it's read the cue cards and it's it's one of the most unbelievable projects i've ever been a part of it was so much fun and i have so much respect for everybody there i think one thing people don't understand about that show you do a full live run through of the show two hours before the main show audience and everything that's a half hour longer than the regular show and then they cut it down, change things, and you have to know everything that's happening by the time the actual live show starts. It's unreal. Yeah, hey, I, I will. I will tell you this too: that the the uh, the takeoff, the Rudy takeoff called Robbie <laughs> that you did was absolutely hilarious. Thank I was you. Chuckster. Have you seen that thing? I didn't you've see got, that one. You've got to go online and look up. J.J. Watt, SNL, Robbie. It is the <laughs> funniest takeoff on the movie, Rudy, you have ever seen in your life. Well done. It was perfect. Thank um, you. It was it was fun. That one, as soon as they gave me, they pitched me that one on Tuesday, I said, that's our winner right there. Yeah, really, really good. Um, let's see, Chuckster? I was, I, we, we can't not talk to J.J. without talking about his charitable stuff. Yep. I mean, what he did, what he's done for the Houston area uh, is one of the greatest things we've ever seen a jock do as far as uh, raising money during the whole hurricane situation. Uh, what was the final total, JJ? Uh, 42 million. Wow. I mean, Dude. number one, I just want to say thank you because I really enjoyed living in Houston. Uh, I, I couldn't play anymore, but I enjoyed my time there. And I really always, I tell the fans, I really appreciate them not booing me because I really <laughs> suck. I really sucked my last two years there, but they treated, <laughs> they treated me wonderful. So Houston will always have a special place in my heart. And I just want to tell you, thank you for all the friends I made when I was down there for my last four years, man. The stuff you've been doing for charity has been amazing and keep up the great work. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. It's nice of you to say. Uh, the people of Houston have been unbelievable to me. I mean, I've been lucky enough to be down there for nine years, and they've treated my family and I so well, and it's been so fun to become a part of that family, and it truly does feel like a family to me. So it's been a lot of fun down there, and it's been great. Uh, they love you down there. I was actually, I was talking, I got a funny story for you. I was talking one day, uh, we were on the bus on the way to the airport to go to an away game. And the police officer was sitting by me uh, that escorts us. And he was telling me, he goes, yeah, man, I used to do escorts for the Rockets back in the day. And, you know, they get home at like two or three in the morning and, you know, nobody's on the highways at all. There's nobody out there and I'm on patrol. So I'm just sitting in my car. And all of a sudden, every, every time they'd have an away game, this fancy car would just go flying past me. And the first couple of times I pulled it over and it was Charles Barkley. And I'd be like, hey, Chuck, you got to slow it down a little bit, big guy. And he'd go on his way. <laughs> I believe so that. he was just telling me stories about the old days. You guys would get home early. And he said, it was, he said you were the best and you were always a pleasure to work with. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, man. I got a lot of respect. I, I'd always tell people, man, I got respect for cops. I admire them, firemen, teacher, police, anybody in that field. Uh, shout out again to our first responders out there because, man, what they're going through with this virus is uh, they're on my level with cops and, and firemen right now and teachers. It's amazing. JJ, my last thing before we let you go. Uh, when you were at Wisconsin, was there a time, there was a time, correct, that you were delivering pizzas for Pizza Hut? Yeah. When I first transferred to Wisconsin, uh, I, had, I had to actually sit out. So I, I left Central Michigan in December and had didn't start at Wisconsin until June. So for that six months before I started at Wisconsin, I went to a local community college here and I delivered pizzas. Um, and I gotta say, it's not the worst job in the world. You know, you get to drive around, listen to music and get free pizza. Best tip you ever got? Oh, uh, $60. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a big corporate thing with like, they were like 15 pizzas. 
um, and they tip sixty dollars. I mean, when I was delivering, there was like a after about a month of it, I figured out the levels of tips. Like one would be no tip, obviously, just nobody. They don't tip you at all. Three dollars is like a very good tip. I'd be like, that's I appreciate a three dollar tip. That's I would say about the standard. Five dollars was like the holy grail. You're like a five dollar tip is incredible, <laughs> and anything over five dollars, you were living large. And I would literally, if we ever got an order from them again, I would specifically remember their name, and that pizza would be there within about fifteen minutes because I knew it was coming. Well, I just want to say. Uh... As a sports fan, and I'm a fan of yours, obviously, I'm glad you quit your other job and got your day job now. <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> hey, thank you, my brother. Thank you, guys. I hope you guys have a great day. I appreciate you having me. Great talking uh, to you, JJ. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was yeah, great. A, yeah, he's a good dude, man. I, it, 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 the stuff he does for charity, Ernie, man, is just amazing. To raise that much money, I mean, God, you got, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I'm telling you, you've got to look. You've got Robbie? To look at that. Robbie. Okay, I'll look at it today. It oh, ain't like you... I got any, Ernie. It ain't like I got anything else to do. Dude, it is so funny. Back here on the steam room. This is uh, the legendary Tim Kiley, longtime producer of Inside the NBA, the, brain, the brains behind the operation, uh, who... <laughs> Who weekly joins us to bring us up to speed on uh, some of the uh, some of the the biggest news of the week and some maybe Brains. some some that's what you got out of that whole intro. That's the word that stuck out with you. The brains, brains behind the operation. Yeah. Anyway, he he has news that's interesting, maybe offbeat a little bit. TK, what do you got this week? Uh, Aaron, uh, can I give a shout out? Is that your shack? Yeah. <laughs> You know, give a shout out. Yeah, go ahead. Give me a shout right. out. Okay. Um, this is the sixth and final week, and I don't understand why it's the final week of the Ernie Johnson Journalism School yes. on Twitter, right? Right. So you got some incredible guest lecturers, and uh, in this business, you know, it's what's known as a toss, Ernie. Let's roll the clip. Thanks to Ernie Johnson, who's been an awesome guy over the years. I hate doing this stuff. That's why I never do them, but he asked me to do it and I can't say no to him. And class is in session. What is the number one trait that is needed to be successful on the air? The best description I ever heard is that you are an exaggerated version of yourself. How do you connect with athletes? Treat normal people like superstars, treat superstars like normal people. I don't think I talk to the athletes much different than I'm talking to myself on this phone right now. How do you get over any kinds of anxiety of being on camera? The number one way to get more comfortable with being on camera is being on camera. P. Diddy 2499 wants to know, can I beat Elevator Ernie Johnson in a one-on-one -on -one game? You know, yes. What is the best piece of advice you've been given from someone in journalism? This is life advice from Ernie Johnson. Be a fountain, not a drain contribute more than you take. Leave places better than you found them. I think that there is probably no person that sums that up better than Ernie. And it's something that has stuck with me for years and I think will stick with me for years to come. That was very nice of you guys to put together, but I, I and it's been, TK, I gotta tell you, you know, six weeks, um, and it wraps up on Friday with Maria Taylor from uh, uh, ESPN. I wanted her to do the last class because she was supposed to deliver the commencement address at the University of Georgia this year. And I don't know how they're going to handle all that now. So I wanted her to have the last one. But I they just gonna, they, they just got to get <clears throat> GEDs out to everybody who went to Georgia. No, that's, we're not talking about Auburn here. We're talking <laughs> about Georgia. So, uh, but the thing that's been cool, TK, is I've learned so much from from just listening to all those because because so many cool people in this business have taken part in it from James Brown to SVP to Seth Davis, Brian Anderson, Allie LaForce. I mean, you name it. And, and so we've really had fun with it. And I think journalism students out there are learning things or have learned things in the course of six weeks that they could never have just gotten in a classroom. Well, and I think the key word there is listen. Um, because that's what you've always done. And God knows how you can listen with those lunatics screaming on each side of you. 
We go to commercial break. It's the it's the loudest. It's louder than a, a, a pre K class. Yo, man, I'm not gonna let you talk about. It. I'm not gonna let you bad about Kenny and Shaq while they're not here to defend themselves. What about yourself? No, no, you know, you said you said the guys beside him. That'd be Kenny and Shaq. <laughs> okay, all right. But I got something for you, Chuck. You were on Coffee with Cal with John Calipari. He has his own little podcast, right? Listen to this clip, Barney. Charles, they built a statue for you at Auburn. A statue with. Hey, well, first of all, two things. Uh, number one, I'm probably the only person in the world who's never had coffee in my life. Never. Never, never had, had coffee. coffee. Never had coffee a day in my life. Why? I, I. It just has never. It just never came into my thinking and thing. I've never had coffee in my life. What about tea? I've only had tea when I was sick. I'm not gonna lie. Remember when I y'all y'all banned me from smoking during the All Star game because I lost my voice like every year because I'd go out <laughs> smoking on Thursday and Friday I would lose my voice, and y'all gave me tea to get my voice back. I'm drinking tea right now, as a matter of fact. The, well, you don't need your voice right I'll now. Join there's, you, Ernie. I, there's the, hey, there's absolutely nothing going on right now. You don't need this your is voice going right on, now. Chuckster. This is going on. You gotta you gotta have the voice for this. This is a this is the world's second most popular podcast. Okay, you're right. <laughs> That's not all he said. Uh oh. I'm Cal saying. Go ahead, roll tape, Cap. And let me tell you, secondly, as much money as I give it over, they should have built three statues. Hey, Come on, gonna, man. You know, you know what I said. I saw that statue. I looked around, and I was going to take a pee on it, and there were people watching. So I said, I better not do that. <laughs> Hey man, I, I'm How really proud. Bearded Coach Cal, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, let me tell you something. Cal's not the only one. We need to get out of this quarantine because some of these dudes who can't shave and cut their hair, they need. They got some issues. I mean, I've seen some ugly beards and some ugly hairstyles out there because people can't go to the salon. Uh, Cal needs to shave, or and that can hurt that thing. Hey, Cheryl uh, Ann. Cheryl Ann trimmed it up yesterday. Ernie, yeah. anytime you need a haircut, just jump in the shower. Enough will fall out to make it look like you're cutting. <laughs> <laughs> Love you guys. Miss you. Hey, good luck to the Steelers this year. Uh, we need JK. We are back now to uh, wrap up another edition. Are you, hold it, are you clapping because we're wrapping it up or are you just clapping because you're excited? I'm excited about the answer machine because it, like, Ernie, we, I get so excited. We get these international calls. Like, I was really happy with Australia. That was pretty awesome. And then last week, we got Switzerland. This yeah. is amazing. The answering machine number, 404-987-0330, 404-987-0330. Well, I mean, I don't know if we're going to have an international call this time around, but here we go. It's time for Chuck's answering machine. You've reached Charles Barkley. Leave a message, America. Hey, Chuck. Love you and forget Paris. My question is for both of you guys, actually. <laughs> what do you think of the newest episodes of The Last Dance? Want to hear what your thoughts are. Thanks, man. Love you. Hey, man, well, we, number one. We touched on this. We touched on this, Chuckster, when we were talking to J.J. Yeah. Watt. But, yeah, obviously the Dennis Rodman stuff. Um, how about Sager giving him 20 bucks in the hallway? I said, I'll, I know. I'll pay for your fine. Hey, but the thing that was amazing to me, I'm not going to lie. Like, first of all, I loved all four episodes. But I know Michael well enough when Phil said, and Michael says, well, yeah, when he said Dennis got something to tell you, he knew it wasn't going to be good. <laughs> but the notion that a guy would actually ask for a vacation, he says, Scotty just took a vacation. And Phil Jackson was like, hey, Dennis needs a vacation. And Michael is like, typical, I need a vacation. But I will tell you this, there's nothing wrong with going to get Dennis out of bed and he's got Carmen Electra right there. There's nothing wrong <laughs> so with that. So that's your biggest takeaway from <laughs> That's my biggest takeaway. <laughs> hey, that's, hey, that was my biggest takeaway. If you're gonna get one of your friends out of bed, he might as well be with Carmen Electra. Uh.
Let's go to, back to the answering machine. What do you say? War Eagle, Chuck. Loyal steamer here. I was thinking about how you once said that you go get a Manny Petty every week. So since everything has been shut down for a while, how bad are your cuticles right now? Ooh, let's see. Hold them up to the hold them uh, up to the lens. Hey, let me just say this. Number one, I just want to say, War Eagle, back to you. This has been the most stressful time in my life. Me worrying about my fingernails and my feet. Uh, I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances. I'm soaking my hands and my feet at least three days a week, and I'm scrubbing all in the what? crust in like a big, what? Of what? I I mean, a, a big old tub. A what? A big old like a big plastic tub, and I got me one of those cheese graters to scrape all the crap off. The <laughs> Why are you laughing, Ernie? They sell stuff for your feet. You don't have to get an actual cheese grater. It's it's it, no, uh, it, it's not an actual tree. It's a tree's grater for your feet. For your feet, okay. Yes. Okay. So I, I've been I've been <laughs> working on my feet at least three days a week. Mm. I soak them in. Uh, first of all, I soak them in Epsom salt. Yeah. And then I scrape all the the cheese, the S S, -S cheese, <laughs> cow cow. <laughs> The hey. excess cheese. Hey, let me oh. just tell you something. I cannot wait to get a man and petty. I ain't even gonna lie. My cuticles, hey, they are so long and hard and dry right now. But the main thing, I worry about my feet, man. I'm scraping these feet. I gotta get this cheese off my feet, man. It's See, ugly now, right now. Now you're wishing that you were down here in Georgia. No, I'm not wishing it that bad until y'all see how it's <laughs> gonna turn out for y'all. I'm not ready to come back to Georgia yet. Well, pity the uh, the manicurist who uh, who gets the responsibility uh, on your first trip back for a mani pedi, because when she or he or she looks at the damage that you've done with the cheese grater, <laughs> it's going to be that's going to be an experience. Oh my goodness, <laughs> Chuckster! Great talking to you as always. Great spending time with you on uh, on Thursdays for the steam room and hang in there, kid. You know we're yes, all yes, sir, brother. Hey, bless everybody out there, man. Y'all, please stay safe. And like I said, you guys know what Atlanta means to me. Uh, please be safe out there. Uh, I know y'all got a lot going on with the governor relaxing the rules, but man, please be safe. And uh, maybe we'll just play it on the uh, on the steam room. The world's second most popular podcast. I like it. I like it, Ernest. <laughs> See you I next love week, it. Kid.